and uh, it's good to see you in, in the service. Appreciate the Lord's presence with us this morning, and I'm glad to be able to come back here tonight. I want to remind all the seniors now, don't forget about your senior dinner on the 17th. That's the Saturday following camp meeting at 4 o'clock down here in the fellowship building. Take your Bibles tonight, please, and open with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians and chapter number 4. I want to talk a little bit tonight about life. And uh, moreover, the, the realities of man's life here on earth. A lot of reason that people are unhappy, unsatisfied, unfulfilled is because they live in a fantasy. They've lost touch with reality. I was talking to someone Wednesday night before the meeting out in the lobby, and we was talking about the, the downfall of our country and how it's gone away from where it was even 40 or 50 years ago. And I remember saying pe people have just lost their mind. They've lost touch with reality. People want everything and they want it right now. You know, growing up, if you wanted a little something to eat on and you wanted it warm, you need to wait till the stove warmed up, or the furnace, uh, the furnace, <laughs> the oven warmed up. Now you just stick anything you want in that box and push that button and nucleate it and you got food quick. It's not good and it's probably not good for you. And I'm sure some fancy lawyer is going to find, find something in that microwave and start a big lawsuit and get on television and add for it. I'm waiting. And uh, I'm waiting for the day when the first attorney gets on. You know them. You know how they are. Do you use baby powder? Do you eat fish? Use Roundup. Well, I, you, I'll sue the fire out of them and you can get you a big settlement. You know what I'm waiting on? I'm waiting on a lawyer to get on television and say, do you have breathing problems because you were forced to wear a mask? Are you suffering from CO2 poisoning? Do you have all these different kinds of problems in your life because you wore a mask? Call me and we'll get you a big settlement. People have lost their minds. We need a reality check. And there's no better place to get a reality check than God's Word. So in the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians, I'd like for you to look with me in verse number 8. Paul here writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said we are troubled on every side. That's an encouraging thought, isn't it? But when we think, when we think about the reality of our life, that's true, isn't it? We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. 
For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that which are not seen are eternal. The realities of man's life on earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the good singing by the choir and the special number tonight at Old Rugged Cross. And Lord, we just thank you for each one that's in attendance this evening. And Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help me stay on, on topic. And Lord, don't let me run rabbits and chase uh, rabbits down or through the way tonight. But let me stay right on what you've given me to give to this congregation. Holy Spirit, speak to the heart. Encourage each one, we pray, through your word tonight. May you receive all the glory and praise for it. For Lord, we need your power to preach, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen and amen. Life, in theory, the way many people live it, is a dream. But life in reality is a whole nother matter. And I believe I would be correct in what I'm about to say is that the difference in having a life that is fulfilling, that is satisfying, that is God honoring is not so much in how we live it, but rather who we live it for. Jesus talked about that. And uh, he talked in comparison of between God and mammon, between God and material, between God and finance or material things. And he made it clear that you can't serve two masters You can only serve one. And the one that you love the most is probably the one that you're going to feed the most and the one that you're going to give the emphasis to the most. And if that's the flesh, then that's where your emphasis, that's where your passion will be. But if it's the Lord that you love supremely above all, it is Him uh, that'll have your passion and your and his and the preeminence will be in him in your life. Charles Swindoll said about life that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% of how we react to it. Now you think about that in comparison to who you're living your life for. How, how in your 90% do you handle the 10% of what's happened to you? Abraham Lincoln once said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. Ronald Reagan once said, live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly, and leave the rest to God. Bob Jones Sr., who sure could turn a phrase, said the test of your character is what it takes to stop you. Trust God as if it all depends on Him and work as if it all depends on you. Charles Spurgeon simply stated, speaking of life, said nothing puts life in men like a dying Savior. Boy, that's a true statement, isn't it? Of course, the greatest advice that we could ever heed on living life we find from the Lord Jesus himself, of course, in his word. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verses 32 and 33, listen to the words of our Lord. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. This was spoken tonight before he was crucified. And he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, 
but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So it really is true. The difference between life miserable or life mediocre or life abundant is not how we live it, but who we live it for. And who we live it for will affect how we live it. Tonight, I took this text, and really, really all I'm going to use is the first three verses of the text that I read and the last three verses of the text that I read to bring out what I want to share with you, what I feel like the Lord would have me share with you tonight. First of all, in verses 8 and 9, uh, parts of verses 8 and 9, I want us to look first of all at the reality of life in the natural man. We're considering the natural man, not the saved man, not the spiritual man, not the Christian man, the, the natural man, this right here, us in our flesh. Now this is the life, this is the reality of the life in the natural man. We are troubled on every side. Now you can amen that. Amen, we, we're troubled on every side, everywhere we turn around. Uh, if we choose, there's trouble somewhere coming down the line. Now that word trouble there means to be afflicted and it means to be distressed. And uh, there's many a time that we come in here uh, to worship together and we're trying to keep a smile on our face and trying to keep a good attitude, but on the inside we're afflicted and we're distressed by some trouble that has come down the road in our life. And it's difficult to deal with from time to time. Of course, Job said that man that is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. So we understand that by the mere virtue that we're human beings and born of women. I hope all of you were born of women. Yeah, man. I believe you were. I hadn't seen any of you have cosmic rays shooting out of your eyes or anything like that. Uh, we're, it's, our days are few and our troubles are just... Many, all the time, we're full of trouble. Well, that, that's, that's life, the reality of life in the natural man. is Our life is a troubled life. Secondly, we see that the reality of life in the natural man, he says in verse 8, we are perplexed. Well, that's, a, that, that, that's the reality of life in the natural man. And listen, when I'm saying the natural man, I'm not excluding us. We still have the natural man, amen? We still have that natural man. And many times we're perplexed. Well, what does that mean, preacher? Well, to be perplexed means to, you're, you, to be at a loss. Uh, to, be, uh, to have a doubtful attitude. To simply don't know how to handle things and how to take your next step. And in and, and our natural condition, we're perplexed all the time. We're just at a loss sometimes that we, you know, things that go on in our life. But thirdly, he says that the reality of life in the natural man is that uh, we are uh, persecuted. Persecuted. All of you in here has been persecuted one time or another for one reason or another. Because persecuted in this text simply means to be molested or harassed and uh, who has gone without harassment in your life I don't believe there's a hand raised somebody has harassed you that's, that's our lot in our natural life so the reality of life in the natural man is trouble and perplexity and persecution and, and one more thing he says in verse number 9 he says we're cast down I, I, I was really hoping that when I studied out that little phrase, cast down, that I would find some deep theological nugget that I could share with you and look real intelligent in front of you. But you know what it means? That to be cast down means something grabbed you and threw you to the ground. That's what being cast down means. Now, it may not be literal somebody come along and throwed you to the ground, but life sure does make you feel like you get thrown to the ground. Life will beat the life out of you. But that's the reality of the natural man. 
And the natural man glorifies himself. Look what I did. You know, I love to hear the request of prayer in our prayer rooms. Because very rarely, at least in the men's prayer room, and I'm sure it's the same in the ladies, most of the prayer requests in the men's prayer room are never for the men that are making the request. They're, they're always for somebody else. Pray for my family. Pray for my boss at work. Pray for uh, this friend of ours who's battling cancer. Pray uh, for this one that's sick or that one. And, and one of my favorite prayer requests, and I'm not putting this prayer request above any of the others, God knows my heart. But one of my favorite prayer requests is the simple one that says, pray for the lost. Because we need to pray for the lost. So life, the reality of life in the natural man is troubled, perplexed, persecuted, cast down. And the natural man lives for himself. Look what I did, or woe is me. But then secondly, in these very same verses, I see the reality of life in the spiritual man. I don't just see the natural man, but I see the spiritual man. Hang on, are you ready for this? Here's the reality of life. In the spiritual man, we are troubled on every side. Whoa, hold her, hold her right there, preacher. I thought you said that was the reality of the natural man. Let me finish. The reality of life in the spiritual man is we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. That's the reality of life in the spiritual man. Yes, we're afflicted. Yes, we're distressed. Yes, we're few of days and full of troubles. But we're not distressed. That, that word distressed right there carries the idea of being compressed and to be cramped up. Now, <laughs> we may have trouble in our life as a child of God, but it doesn't compress us and disable us and put us out of commission where we can't serve God. It doesn't cramp us up. We're able to keep going because we are the children of the Most High God washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Here's the second thing about the reality of life in the spiritual man. We are perplexed, yeah. We're perplexed just like the natural man is. We get in doubt. We're at our wit's end. We're at a loss. We don't know what to do. But the Bible says as a spiritual man, we are perplexed, but not in despair. We might have life pressing down on us to the point that we are at a loss of what to do. Well, we know what we can do. We go to the Lord. Because that word despaired there, or uh, despaired, means to renounce all hope. So we are perplexed, but we have not renounced all hope. What did Paul tell the church at Galatians our hope was? Hmm. The Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a spiritual man... We have trouble, we're perplexed, but we're not distressed and we're not in despair. I love this next one. Persecuted, but for the spiritual man, but not forsaken. (laughs) Yeah, we get harassed and we get molested and and, um, we go through those persecutions as a child of God. 
whether severe or not severe, it's still persecution. But we understand that in that persecution, as a child of God, we can hold our head high and praise the Lord because we are not forsaken. That means that we are not abandoned. How about that? Pretty good life, isn't it? Yeah, talking about the life of the spiritual man now. Troubled and perplexed and persecuted. Oh, but we're not distressed, we're not in despair, and we are not abandoned. But then he tells us that we also are cast down. Mm -hmm. It's all right for you to amen. There's nobody here but you and the Lord. But there are times that life throws us to the ground. And the devil laughs at us. And the naysayers say, where is your God now? Well, the poor old natural man, he has nothing to lean upon. But though we are cast down, in verse number 9, it says, but not destroyed. Life may throw us to the ground, but it does not destroy us. We are not perished and we are not ruined. This is the reality of the spiritual man. And the spiritual man's life glorifies Jesus, not ourself. Now, look at the last three verses. And hold on, I'm getting ready to start my last point of the message. Come on, you can get happy about that. You know, at least I ain't like Paul. You read the book of Philippians at least twice, maybe three times. Paul said, and finally, and he keeps on preaching, and finally, and he keeps on preaching. At least I don't do you that well. I don't tell you when finally, amen. But in the last three verses, 16, 17, and 18, I want to touch base thirdly on the reality of life's struggles for the saved. You ever heard people talk about when you get into Bible and study the Bible, you can find them, find them gold nuggets. You can dig up them gold nuggets and boy, you can take them with you and they'll do you good. Well, in these three little verses, there's three gold nuggets that I want to give to you. And this is not a pyre of positive thinking seminar, amen. I'm not up here to make you feel good about yourself. I'm up here to encourage you from God's word about dealing with and living with life's struggles. Because we all have them. Because verses 8, 9, and 10 tell us that we have those struggles. First of all, I want you to notice in verse number 16... The Bible says, for which cause, and the cause is Christ, living for Christ. For this cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now what kind of a gold nugget can we find in that when we talk about dealing with troubles and perplexities and disparities and being persecuted and cast to the ground. Where do we find a gold nugget there? Here it is. God gives us fresh strength for every new day. Isn't that wonderful? Now he ties this all back in verse 16 when he says, For which cause we faint not. We don't fall out by the way serving the Lord. Yes, we're troubled. Yes, we have all these other issues. But we have no reason to quit and fall out because every day the Lord gives us fresh strength. Now, he addresses the troubles and all those other things in verses 8 and 9. Here in verse number 16 when he says, But though our outward man perish. Well, we know that. I mean, I don't have to stand up here and convince you that you're getting old, duh. 
Sorry, I had a little lisp there. I couldn't get the er out. You know you're getting older. You know you're not getting better. You're getting worse. Amen, Brother David. That's right. And all you have to do is go look in the mirror. And you can spray it and paste it and paint it and do whatever you want to. But when all that goes away and you're left with the, general, general, the, the genuine article, we're, we're not getting better, we're getting worse. And we know that our outward man perisheth every day. But that's the natural man. We're talking about now the spiritual man. Well, what happens to the spiritual man? Well, the Bible says, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We're strengthened day by day. We're getting stronger. As the outside gets weaker, the inside's getting stronger. That's why you need to stay in your Bible and stay on your knees and stay on these pews, amen, to continue strengthening that outward man. Moses said, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And old brother Barry Uton's favorite verse, Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not fail. So I want you to always remember in the reality of life's struggles, that God gives us fresh strength every day. Move down to verse number 17. And I find a second gold nugget here in the first part of verse 17 when he speaks and says, For our light affliction is but for a moment. I want us to remember a second gold nugget that God has for us in this little 17th verse and that is that nothing that we face in life lasts forever. It came to pass. It came to pass. I like that. Not just referring to an event, but it came to pass. And whatever we're going through now, whatever the trouble... Whatever the perplexities, whatever uh, of the persecution, whatever the cast down event that's going on in your life, God's going to give you fresh strength to deal with it every day. And secondly, it's not going to last forever. I know it may feel like it, but it is not going to last forever. Well, how do you know that, preacher? Because that's what the Bible says. For our light affliction which is but for a moment. Now we may have different types of troubles and persecutions and all of that for the rest of the days that we live, but none of them is going to last forever. God will deliver. Now Simon Peter uh, encourages us that with that great truth in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. He said, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while. You see the temporary thing there? It's just temporal. He says, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So, In the reality of the things that we struggle through in life, all of the troubles mentioned in verses 8 and 9, we have the guarantee from God's Word uh, that God will give us fresh strength to face it and that it will not last forever. Third gold nugget I want you to remember that I find here in this little text of Scripture in the latter part of verse number 17 and in verse number 18, and here it is. He says that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, watch this, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. That's what I just got through preaching. 
But the things which are not seen are eternal. So write down this third nugget. Everything we face in this life has a purpose. God has a reason for it. God allowed it to come. And nowhere in the Bible can I find anywhere that teaches that God sends things in our life because he gets amusement out of picking on us. No, sir, I don't find that anywhere. Everything, and remember this, everything that God does, he does for our good and for his glory. Remember that. Everything that he does is for our good and for his glory. And so he tells us here that this affliction that we're facing the struggles that we're enduring, he says that they are in the process of working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Can I give you a very familiar verse? And, and, and I think this verse fits it just perfect. I've had people tell me before, I wish you'd quit using that verse. Well, when God takes it out of the book, I will. But Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. Now the scripture does not say that all things are good. That's not what it says. It says all things work together for good. It tells us what God is going to do. God takes the bad, the undesirable. God takes the things that are good. And when they're all mixed up, all things work together for good. It's like hot biscuits or hot pound cake or, you know... I mean, there, there, is, there, there is stuff in my wife's spice rack that I don't think there's ne'er one up there that I would take down and just take a big old mouthful of it. I don't eat raw eggs. I don't take a spoon, sit down and eat lard. Amen? Y'all forgive me, but I ain't going to sit down and drink a glass of buttermilk either. Be kind. I'm not going to eat salt by itself, and I sure ain't going to get me a big old tablespoon of baking soda or baking powder. I never have understood the difference. But you know, when all that stuff gets thrown together, and it all gets mixed up, and looks like a lump of nothing, but you cut them things out and make little, little round circles out of them and put them in that hot oven for a little while and boy, hot biscuits come out and line me up. I'm there. And if you have to happen to have a pot of sausage gravy beside of it, I'll have some of that too. Man, don't you, don't you have choir practice long and I'm done got hungry, all right? <laughs> You understand the analogy? There's a lot of salt and baking soda and lard and stuff like that in our life when it comes to the affairs of our life. But God gives us fresh strength to face it every day. And the Lord told us in His Word, it's not going to last forever. Hang in there. It's just for a little while. And child of God, I love you. And I'm doing all of this for a purpose. I'm doing this to make you more like me, Jesus said. And all those things work together for good. That's the reality of life. Life is full of troubles and perplexities and persecutions and being cast down. It sure is. But you know what? Because we know Him, we're not distressed and, and we're not perplexed and we're not in all those things. We're delivered. We're not abandoned. We're not forsaken. And the Lord encourages, go on. You know the reason life's so hard, don't you? Yeah. Big theological word spelled S-I-N. That's, that's why there's so much trouble in the world. 
But I thank God he gives us what we need to get through with each day. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture and letting us see the reality. Lord, remind us how things really are. There's so much falsehood, so much lying, so much deception in this world at the hands of ungodly men and women. But Lord, thank you for bringing us back to reality tonight. and We thank you for showing us how life is without you, but then showing us how good life is with you and reminding us that though we live in a sin-cursed world and we have to face a sin-cursed people and, and we have to face sin every day that we live and fight those temptations, Lord, you've given us some great nuggets, some great promises here in these last three verses to help us get through life and live a life that's abundant and overcoming and a life that will bring you glory. Tonight I pray for anyone that may be in our midst that is unsaved. I pray that they would come to the altar tonight. Let me have a word of prayer with them. Show them how to be born again. And I pray that someone's been helped from the word of God tonight. Some saved person may have gotten some help to encourage them along life's way. Lord, you deal with the heart tonight. and You have your way in Jesus' name. Amen.